This is the second video in our series on invertebrate diversity. In this video, we're going to look at mollusks as a case study. When we left our story, we had worked our way up through the invertebrates uh, all the way to the protostome branch of the coelomates, where we ended with annelids. In this video, we'll spend our entire time talking about the phylum Mollusca. These are mollusks. As you can see, there's a pretty broad diversity within mollusks. We're going to use this group to explain some concepts that we see in the diversity of invertebrates. We'll start with some general terms. The phylum Mollusca. All mollusks are soft-bodied animals with some variation of a muscular foot. They all have an outer coat called a mantle. And the mantle, whoops, that's not what I wanted. The mantle secretes minerals that form a protective shell. Within the phylum mollusca, we have three classes. Gastropoda. The word gastropoda means stomach foot. Gastro means stomach. Poda, or pod, means foot. The gastropods are the snails and slugs. When you think about it, it makes sense to call them stomach foot because they move along on their stomach. Our next group within the phylum mollusca are the pecalopods or the bivalves, meaning two shells. Pecalopoda means hatchet foot. Examples are clams and oysters. You can see the two shells, bivalva, and the hatchet foot used to burrow down into the mud. And finally, our third group is the cephalopods. Cephala means head, poda means foot, cephalopod, head foot. These are the squid and octopus, and their muscular foot has been modified as grasping tentacles. Each of these groups within mollusks have distinctive traits. We're going to try to connect some of the physical characteristics with these lifestyle traits in a case study. The other big thing we need to look at with the phylum mollusca that's true for all mollusks, going back to kind of looking at evolutionarily important uh, additions as we have moved up this, for the first time in mollusks, we're going to see a specialized gas exchange surface. Some organ or structures that are designed to exchange oxygen for carbon dioxide and have some relationship with the circulatory system in order to move those gases through the body. So the first question is what makes for any good gas exchange surface? Well, it's got to have a large surface area across which to make the exchanges. If you think about the branches within the lungs or the folds within gills, we see large surface area. Up until now, animals that we've looked at have used their skin as their gas exchange surface. Thin and moist. Surfaces that are good for gas exchange need to be thin because we don't want to diffuse gases across multiple layers. And typically moist uh, tissues allow gases to move easier than dry tissues. Highly vascularized, meaning good blood flow. Once we get the gases in, we need to deliver them to all parts of the body, and we need to bring waste gases like carbon dioxide to the uh, gas exchange surface to be released. So we need a blood flow. And if you have a large surface that's thin and moist and has large blood flow, it needs to be protected, maybe inside of a rib cage or inside of a shell or up tucked underneath the operculum in a fish. So gas exchange surfaces typically have these qualities. Now let's get into some specifics. Let's start with the gastropods, the stomach foot, common name snails and slugs. We said that the gastropod, uh, in the gastropod, the muscular foot is specialized for locomotion. They move around on their stomach. That's how they locomote. But they're not fast moving. They're cephalized. They have a head. We can see that here uh, with distinct sensory and feeding structures. But let's talk about the feeding lifestyle of a gastropod, of a snail or a slug. They have a specialized structure called a radula for scraping food. Um, but basically, they're general feeders. They eat upon whatever they come upon. They're scavengers. They're not going to hunt or chase down their food, but they're also not going to just sit and wait for it to come by. They're going to go out and search and scavenge. They have gills for gas exchange, and the gill is tucked up underneath their shell so it's protected. If they're a terrestrial snail or slug, they have a simple lung um, and gills of aquatic. The circulatory system is also very interesting. It's an incomplete system 
Whereas in the segmented worms we saw a closed circulatory system, here we have an open circulatory system. The blood is pumped by a muscular heart and the blood squirts out into the body tissue. They're open-ended blood vessels. It's not a complete loop. Now this is an inefficient system, but it's efficient enough. Think about it. How much uh, or how efficient does it need to be for such a slow-moving, creeping animal? Let's look at this diagram in a, a little bit closer detail. Let's move this and this and whoops, this out of there. Um, we can see uh, again the feeding, uh, the mouth, and the digestive system. Um, we can see the gill, and we have a heart here uh, in the red. It has blood vessels running to the gills, but those blood vessels then pump the blood out into the body tissue, where then by gravity it collects back to the heart and is pumped back out again. So while not the most efficient type of circulatory system, it's efficient enough for this slow-moving, creeping animal. Let's move on to the pecalopods, or the bivalves. For example, clams and oysters, these animals with two shells. Now, in some ways, this seems like a backward step. The muscular foot is specialized for digging. They produce this hard shell, but they're not cephalized. They lack a head. Now, if we look back, we've had a head for a long time. In fact, as soon as we became bilateral, flatworms have a head, roundworms have a head, annelids have a head, some of the mollusks have a head. But the radial animals and the asymmetrical animals lacked a head. There was no front or back, no logical place to put a head. So being bilateral seemed to bring with it being cephalized, yet here we have an animal, a clam, that is bilateral, yet it lacks a head. So it seems to be a two-part thing, a uh, requirement for having a head. One is being bilateral, so there has a logical front and back. And two, well, what is the second reason? Stop the video and think about it. What does a clam not do that all the other cephalized animals do? What did you come up with? How about this? They're not moving. This clam's not going to get up and move to its environment. Therefore, there's no reason to locate the sensory structures in the front. We put sensory structures in the front because they come into contact with the newer part of the environment first. When you're a sessile animal, there's no need to have a head. Along with not having a head, the clams don't have a very well-developed nervous system. The pecalopods don't have advanced sensory systems. Again, they're not moving about. They're sessile, which also relates to their feeding, their feeding strategy. They're filter feeders. They open their shell, they pull water in and across their gills, which they use to trap particles of food. They pass this food on to, along to their digestive system. The gills serve double duty as they're not only a, a filter, but also the gas exchange surface. And we could probably predict now that we have an inefficient circulatory system. We don't need an efficient circulatory system. The circulatory system of the pecalopods is open. Uh, it has limited and open-ended blood vessels. So it's an open circulatory system, which we've said is not the most efficient. Well, all these are related to the fact that the bivalves lead a very inactive lifestyle. Cecil filter feeders, lacking a head, an underdeveloped nervous system, and an open circulatory system. While this seems kind of primitive, it suits their lifestyle. In stark contrast to the non-cephalized pecalopods, we have the cephalopoda, which in their name we can see are cephalized. The squid and octopus. Their muscular foot has been specialized for tentacles, grasping tentacles as these are predatory, fast-moving hunters. With their well-developed nervous systems and sensory systems, they can find and hunt food. We could guess, I could have asked you to guess, but uh, to predict what type of circulatory system, but they have an efficient closed circulatory system, which allows for them to be these fast-moving and large uh, predators. The octopus could never get away with the type of circulatory system or the underdeveloped sensory systems that we have in the pecalopods, nor could it get away with the kind of uh, uh, systems that the gastropods have. So in this one uh, phylum, we have a very distinct kind of a comparison of the pecalopods versus the gastropods versus the cephalopods as we look at the non-cephalized, cephalized, highly cephalized, you could go through and finish filling out this chart as a compare and contrast uh, to finish our case study on the mollusks.
In our next video, we're going to look at orthopods, which is the last of our protostome groups.